Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I am Tasha Davenport, uh, Deputy Executive Director and Chief Operations Officer for CASBO. I'm joined today by Molly McGee Hewitt, uh, CASBO's Executive Director and CEO, and also Sarah Baches, CASBO's Chief Governmental Relations Officer, uh, who will be participating in today's session as well. Uh, Molly will have the privilege of introducing our keynote, if you will, today, uh, Mike Fine in just a moment, but a couple of opening remarks. Uh, first, it's great to see so many. I think we have close to 1,500 registered for this session. Uh, it kind of turned, in my, in my mind, it kind of uh, became the uh, fiscal happy hour is what it reminds me of, right? So uh, with so many people, I think this is your version of the fiscal happy hour. Um, we recognize hundreds of you participating from our uh, webinars over the past couple weeks. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> he just toasted to us. Um, we recognize hundreds of you from participating in our webinars that we've had over the last couple weeks uh, for the purpose of helping us inform our policymakers around the, the critical considerations and implications of reopening schools. So as part of those continued conversations, as we had shared with you over the past two weeks, we what is now our summer speaker series, where we will continue to have experts such as Mike Fine and others really help us continue the conversation around the fiscal health of schools, certainly reopening schools in the fall and beyond. So thank you again for your participation, not only in those sessions, but in today's. A couple of logistics, we will be recording the conversation so that uh, that will be sent to you following uh, probably it, this afternoon or tomorrow as soon as that uh, is compressed and, and digitalized. And also after Molly's introduction, Sarah will be moderating a question and answer session and she'll navigate you through that. And she'll also be updating you, uh, uh, giving you a quick legislative update um, here towards the end of the presentation. So again, this is the beginning of a uh, summer speaker series. Molly, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our guest speaker today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to have so many of you online and as a part of this. So this morning, I have the privilege of introducing somebody who probably needs no introduction for most of us. Mike has been with FICMAT since 2015 becoming the executive director or chief executive officer in 2017. Prior to that, he had 13 years as an interim soup, deputy superintendent and CBO for major school districts. So his expertise and his insight into where we are all today and in our profession is just priceless for us. So it is always great to have him with us. I'm excited about this series this summer. Next week, John Gray will be joining us. So we've got a good array of people. Also, if you have not been tuning in to our Adventures in Ed Funding uh, podcast, please do that as well. So with, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Molly. Uh, good morning, everybody. Molly, good to see you. Um, and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm glad to hear that John Gray is going to be on here next week. I can't wait to see. Can't wait to see what kind of haircut he has. He and I had a bet on which of us would have ponytails first. Um, I have uh, lost that bet because I finally gave up. Uh, what I didn't know is it was John that sent the YouTube videos to my wife on how to cut hair. And about six seconds into the first uh, cut, she goes, "Oops." And I know that was well planned by she and John together. Um, but uh, I've been doing a number of these uh, uh, these webinars for different county offices for uh, soups and CBOs and even board members over the last several weeks. And and certainly as time evolves, uh, we um, get a better sense of information. And literally right now, we are just hours away uh, for all intents and purposes from having a May revised. And if you've heard some of my earlier presentations uh, in the last couple of weeks, I, I often said I wasn't sure how much detail we would really have in the May revised uh, because we're missing critical information on tax receipts as a state um, and that that wasn't going to change by May revised. But we all 
um, have read, obviously, the governor's and Department of Finance announcements last Thursday, which set the stage for a very comprehensive May revised and a comprehensive June budget as well. And so I think any doubt that the May revise will um, include a plan that we can build upon locally to follow, um, those doubts are gone. And I, and I think uh, while you may not like the information that's in the May revised, I think uh, we'll now have information that you can really go to work with um, and plan for your LEAs. So with that, uh, let me remind you here of context a little bit. Um, and actually, before I do that, let me remind you, and, and, and Tasha said this at the beginning, but this webinar, the summer series webinar, um, regular professional developing, development is absolutely critical. I don't know the mix of all 1,400 or so of you that are online, but most of you are going to be um, school business officials. Um, you're going to be involved in cutting a lot of budgets. What we know about budget cuts is sometimes professional development is one of the first things to go. The reality is professional development is an investment, and it's an investment in good times and bad times. It's absolutely critical. Um, costs us a lot to do PD, but it also costs us more when we don't do PD. And CASBO is one of those PD partners for all of you in the school business um, world uh, that's absolutely critical that you continue to um, participate with and support. And so as your membership renewals are out, even this week, um, just encourage that. That's what gives you access to a, a whole variety of CASBO resources um, that um, are invaluable, especially during these uncertain times. So I wanna remind you, um, of the education in California is particularly vulnerable uh, to swings in uh, state funding. And thank you. Um, and so when we look at the uh, school district funding across the United States, you can see that on average states or school districts rely on the states for about 47% of their funding and 37% of property tax. And if you look at California, those are about 10 percentage points different in each case. We rely more heavily on state funding and we rely less heavily on that stable property tax base. Um, and so when we have an event like COVID-19 that impacts state revenues, then schools are immediately going to be impacted as we are feeling right now, not just from an operational standpoint, but very specifically, specifically from a financial standpoint. It is um, our, our funding model um, is heavily reliant on those state funds. And so I also wanna remind you what that looks like mechanically. We have the three big taxes that we're all very familiar with there on the left of the chart, um, personal income, sales and uh, state and sales tax and corporate insurance tax. And you can see the values and these are all pre COVID-19 values um, of these big three. In the information that Department of Finance released last week, we're talking about um, estimating 25% cuts to personal income tax, uh, over 27% to sales and use tax, and over 22% to corporate insurance tax. In total, um, that those taxes would go down over the two-year period this year and next year, about 40, um, $41 mil, uh, billion dollars. And so when you look at this model, you understand those three back, those three um, big taxes fund a whole variety of state funded programs, including Proposition 98. And currently we're in test one of those three tests within Proposition 98. It's the easiest test to compute, a uh, very straightforward 38.9% um, of the state tax receipts from those three categories. And as, uh, um, as everybody knows, we moved that July, uh, that uh, April 15th tax filing deadline out to July, which has left us with a void of information. We thought a void that would carry us beyond the state, the June adopted budget. In fact, the void of information will, but with the great skills at the Department of Finance uh, affirmed for the most part, the day, uh, next day with the Legislative Analyst Office um, report, uh, we now have some sense of what to expect in the short term with regard to both the state tax receipts and its impact on Prop 98. And we know from reading the Department of Finance's guide, uh, letter last Thursday that we're anticipating over this year and next year an $18.3 billion 
adverse impact to Prop 98. And so that obviously is a staggering number. I don't think it was um, a number not to be expected at that level. I'm certainly not surprised by the number. Um, it just, when you actually put um, digits down on a piece of paper on official letterhead um, and they start to become real, um, you're really forced to deal with it. And in many respects, that's exactly what the governor was doing last Thursday, a week ahead of time. He was trying to get us to start thinking about what the real impact was. Um, he was also influence, trying to influence the discussion that's going on right now in Washington, because we clearly believe that the federal government will play a role in how um, some of these cuts and impacts to, to not only education, but um, to other state and local government operations uh, will be uh, mitigated going forward. So one of the most common questions I get over the last several weeks is how does what we're walking into and what we've walked into really um, compare to the Great Recession? We have a strong experience base on how to deal with economic downturns. For those of us that have been around a while, we've, we've dealt with many of them. Um, certainly the most significant one being roughly 10 years ago with the Great Recession. And so the common question is, um, how does this compare? And our response has been, we expect it to be worse. But last Thursday, along with uh, estimated tax revenues, finance gave us a view of comparison to several metrics. And there's any number of metrics that you can use. And yes, these are all estimates. The dark, the darker color, the, the blue there, um, uh, is of uh, the forecast for 2020 compared to uh, the teal there, which is the Great Recession. And you can see across these example metrics, total personal income tax, total wages and salaries, uh, property income, and so on, are all down in greater, uh, to a greater extent than what we had at the Great Recession. The far right category of transfer receipts, these are transfers of, of funds coming from other sources and and so unemployment trust accounts, those kinds types of accounts um, would influence that. You can also look at other metrics that aren't just a forecast, but they're known to us right now. We have withholding data for the month of, of March and April. We have uh, unemployment claims. We've heard the governor speak about them um, quite a bit in his noon uh, news press releases over the last several weeks. In fact, we have one in five folks in California unemployed right now. That is the highest level that our official record keeping in California uh, reflects. And we clearly weren't at that level. We were at a level um, quite a bit below that during the Great Recession. So you get a sense that what we're walking into is very different than where we've been. How will the state approach uh, this 18 billion uh, Prop 98 gap. The first thing we have to remember if we go back a couple slides is that the 18 billion is over two years. Um, part of that is this current fiscal year between for the remaining six weeks here that we have of this fiscal year and a bigger portion of that obviously is next year. It's important to break it down and when we look and, and analyze the 18 billion, it will be important to note that some of it is this fiscal year, some of it is next fiscal year. That actually makes the size of it slightly more manageable, although I will be the first to tell you that there's nothing about this that is manageable, I think, in the true sense of the word that we're used to. But how will the state approach this? This 18 billion is what I call the gross number. And no matter what your definition of gross is, it's gross, right? It's, it's gross as your kids would describe gross, but it's also gross as those of us with accounting background would describe gross. It's the, it's the first number, it's the largest number. And what we really want to focus on is the net number. So what, what's the difference between the gross and the net in this example will be those mitigating factors that the state will share with us in the May revised and that will be further developed in the June adopted budget and most likely even further developed in what I expect to be a, a more permanent one year budget come probably in the fall after we've seen the tax data through July. And so starting with 18, I'm going to ignore the fact that 18.3 is over two years for just illustration purposes, but starting with 18.3, um, how do we work that down to a net uh, that you can then start to anticipate it in your um, LEAs at the local level? The first 
um, item I think the state will do is they'll turn to deferrals. It was a tool that they used actually prior to the Great Recession. They used it more extensively during the Great Recession. In fact, the peak in the Great Recession of cash deferrals was $10 billion, was just over $10 billion. And while you and I um, may see that purely as a cash flow issue, the state also sees it as an appropriation issue and to what year the appropriation is scored to. And in many respects, it's like a credit card, right? They're going to um, make, a, make a commitment to um, school districts on their credit card and pay it later. And so the very first cash deferral we're gonna see, and we'll go into this in more depth in just a moment, is in this current year, is in June, I believe. I believe we'll see that uh, with the May revision. I don't have any particular insight uh, that, that anybody else doesn't have um, other than just my daily conversations with folks in the Capitol and around the Capitol um, and the back of an envelope types of calculations. But I do think cash deferrals will be one of the first uh, mitigating factors. Cash deferrals put off that obligation for a week, for a month, what's magic about it is it moves it from one fiscal year to the next fiscal year. And the state will continue to do that for multiple fiscal years until the economy is improved and they can begin to lower the amount of uh, deferrals and ultimately make those up. The deferrals during the Great Recession, actually leading into the Great Recession and during the Great Recession is in part what Governor Brown used to refer to as the wall of debt. Ultimately, they created debt for the state to pay back to its local, in this case, local school districts and, and charter schools, our LEAs, community colleges as well. The next item that's on here is um, the size of non-LCFF Prop 98 program cuts. So things like grants, preschool, those kinds of things. Remember Prop 98 is more than just LCFF. And I expect that there'll be some type of fair share kind of cut to multiple programs within Prop 98. Not 100% of the cuts will be made to LCFF. I think that's the good news. Um, but, but we also have to remember, we're in a very different environment today than we were in the Great Recession in that we don't have a whole lot of programs and a whole lot of dollars outside our base funding, right? In the, in the Great Recession, we had 70 some categorical programs in addition to revenue limit. And so there was other opportunities to cut other than just our base funding and the revenue limit. We don't have that same opportunity today. Um, so these will be limited in value of the cuts that are made simply because there's a limited number of programs. But none, this, none but that aside, the, the reality is that probably all programs within 98 will share in some level of cut. There are a couple exceptions to that. I certainly don't expect AB 602 special ed money to be cut, that actually creates a problem for the state. Just like at the local level, you have a federal maintenance of effort requirement, uh, the state has that same requirement. And so um, cutting back on, on AB 602 special ed funds is, is not a, a, a viable option for the state simply because of their own maintenance of effort requirement. The next category is what I call the political category. And the most um, talked about uh, political option is uh, the decision that the legislature and the administration would make around using the budget stabilization count, the BSA. And this is not Boy Scouts of America, it is budget stabilization count. You also know it as the state's rainy day fund. Couple things. Uh, number one, uh, there is no guarantee that the BSA will be used to mitigate cuts to Prop 98. There are no Prop 98 dollars in the BSA. The BSA all 17 billion uh, that's in that fund at this point were, was contributed um, outside of Prop 98. At the same time, certainly schools are an important priority for this legislature and for this administration. They've been very clear about that consistently. Um, and so it, we, we are not very far down on their priority list. Once we deal with the emergency response to COVID-19 and deal with healthcare issues, I would assume that our education system, specifically K-14, will be one of the highest priorities. And therefore, I do think we can expect that there'll be some BSA assistance um, for Prop 98. And that can take many forms. It could take a form of paying down some debt uh, related to us. And the most common place I would turn to in 
In that example would be CalSTRS and CalPERS, maybe a payment on behalf of LEAs, just like we did last June with SB90, um, or in some way mitigating um, a revenue loss to Proposition 98. So there are several options there, but all of each of those are going to be politically driven more than they are just factually and financially and following a formula. Those are the major categories of mitigation. Once we're done with that, we're left with a net amount that we're still short in Proposition 98. And that's the level that I expect would actually result in cuts beginning July 1, just six weeks from now. So let's take a deeper dive on uh, the uh, fiscal realities for the current year. It's my screen changed, so I'm not sure if everybody's screen changed, Sarah. Or uh, we had a we had a very brief power outage, so we're going oh. to bring the screen back up in one moment. Was this a public safety uh, power shutdown? Wanted to interrupt for a small commercial break. So <laughs> there we go. We're back. Great. All right. So I want to take a deeper dive on the current year. Um, obviously, when I started and, and I put this slide together actually weeks ago, and I've been using it over and over. And so that was weeks in advance of the May revised. And our real messaging here was don't wait for the May revised, get started on your planning. Your financial planning for next year cycle was interrupted, right? You all, everybody started in January on time with the Jan 10 governor's budget proposals and you had enrollment projections and all those. Um, you, you started to collect all those building blocks um, of the budget and put those together and had a plan in place as you were moving forward to July 1. That was interrupted in mid-March, right? And our last official reporting uh, was our second interim reports due on March 15th, the same weekend that we started to close schools. Um, in fact, Friday the 13th was the first big school closure announcements right across the state. And so what's critical now is that you update all of that. And on the revenue side, um, we have a fairly stable revenue environment, certainly from an LCFF standpoint, the governor, um, is holding districts harmless for their ADA, which is the big variable um, with regard to LCFF. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean he's holding you harmless with regard to, to the Proposition 98 appropriations, but he is holding harmless um, the ADA calculations, right? However, that doesn't include lottery and other local revenues, which are being adversely impacted. Third quarter lottery is down, fourth quarter lottery will be down, Many of you have facility leases, parent paid programs around transportation or food service, all of which are taking a hit given that school is closed, right? So you need to carefully update your revenue. On the expenditure side, many of you experienced unplanned extraordinary expenses um, in the last six weeks, and those are up. You've all tried to spend a lot of money, uh, but not all of your vendors have cooperated by shipping you devices and access points and all those good things, right? So many of you have bills and many of you don't have bills. It's a mixed bag out there. Um, but generally speaking, most of your expenses are running high uh, than what you anticipated. Yes, things like utilities may be a little lower because schools have been closed and so on. So there are some savings area. The bottom line is you've got to work through and update your second interim report. Reserves certainly are trending down. If you've had unplanned extraordinary expenses, for most of you, turn to your reserves this spring to pay for those. And while that's perfectly understandable, it's also scary because we want to enter into next year, that uncertain murky water of next year, with as strong a reserve position as we can. So we want to be saving every dollar right now and putting it in our fund balance to start July 1 with. We had strong reserves going into this pandemic. In fact, a year ago, uh, we had an average of 17% reserves across school districts, over a billion dollar, over $12 billion worth of reserves. However, it varies widely from LEA to LEA. Some have zero, some have 40%, but on average 17. It is only coincidence that 17 is the national standard by the Government Finance Officers Association it represents about two months of expenditures uh, for most school districts. And so it's certainly a lot stronger position than say 2% or 3% 
uh, state minimum reserve levels. But again, it varies widely by LEAs. Those with stronger reserves will be able to withstand um, these impacts um, in the short term um, in, a, in, a, in a more acceptable manner than some others. Cash, as you all know, um, is as critically important issue as budget. They are intertwined to each other. Budget drives cash, but they are also very different animals. I remind folks every day that the definition of insolvency in K-14 in California is not deficit spending. It's not an upside down budget. It is when you have insufficient cash to meet payroll. That's when the state steps in. Um, and while some of you say, let the state step in and run my school district right now, um, I will tell you that is never a good thing. Never, ever, ever a good thing for your kids in your community. And so we have to make that a priority. We have to monitor cash. Um, during the Great Recession, my predecessor, Joel Montero, used to say, cash is king. And by the end of the Great Recession, he said, cash shows no mercy. And those are absolutely, those are words you need to put up above your desk, on your door of your office, um, on your uh, cubicle somewhere. For those of you responsible for monitoring your district's cash um, and your charter school's cash, you must pay attention to it every day. Uh, just like you do at home, checking your, your account balances online, right? It's not simply sufficient to say, I have checks left over in my checkbook, therefore I must have cash in the bank that I can write those checks on. That's an unacceptable way to manage cash. Um, you've got to check on it each and every day and your county offices are very primed to help you do that. They are your best partner in these environments. Cash was strong. Cash will decline rapidly as we introduce deferrals into the mix. The first one, which will be, uh, I believe, and I'm 90 plus percent confident in this, will be uh, this June's principal apportionment will be deferred. So once you update your budget for this year and look at reserves and then update your cash flow, you need to stress test that cash flow by taking June's principal apportionment out and see where you're at. We've got written guidance on this on our webpage um, that I'll remind you of in just a few minutes here as I close. Um, and it's very clear on what you need to do. Um, and so work with your county offices. If you have a negative cash position when you stress test that, there are options, but begin those conversations. You should have already begun those conversations candidly with your county office. So the key takeaway for the current year is really make sure everything is updated now, yesterday, tomorrow, and keep it updated each and every day. So let's switch to next year, the budget year uh, that starts in six weeks on July 1st, um, our 2021. What we know about revenues, um, obviously um, a couple things. We know a lot more about revenues when, there we go, thank you. We know a lot more about revenues uh, from last Thursday than we did obviously before. But the first thing we know is that all of the governor's proposals from January 10th have been scrapped, right? They are no longer in play. We've seen a rapid decline in state resources and that was reported. We've also seen some initial federal assistance come our way, one, about 1 1.6 billion and, and some other change, um, a little less than 2 billion in total. Uh, you're wondering maybe where those CARES Act dollars are. They have to be appropriated uh, by the state legislature to be able to send out to school districts. And so that'll be done, I believe, as part of the Budget Act in June. And so they'll show up uh, in the next fiscal year. Uh, it's my understanding that at least right now they are subject to the federal cash management policies. And so when we get down to cash, uh, you should not anticipate that those federal resources will all arrive at once. They'll be they'll be apportioned out uh, pursuant to ca federal cash management. We know what the statutory COLA is. We learned that about two weeks ago, uh, very close to where the Department of Finance estimated it to be back in January. They were using 2.29, it came out to 2.31. That's great news, right? Don't be confused by that. Don't let your school board members and your community be confused by that. Um, that's statutory COLA, while important, is very different than funded COLA. And we don't know what the funded COLA will be. We know as a baseline, it's going to be zero. Current law allows the Department of Finance 
to lower the funded COLA based on the state's ability to pay to zero. The question is going to be how far below zero is it? And you can see that FICMAT's been using a range somewhere between minus two and 10. Over the last several weeks, we've updated that to minus five to 10 net reduction. Um, that is purely our back of an envelope calculation. Um, as we look at those mitigating factors that I talked about, so we've now got 18 billion. We've got some values around those mitigating factors that we think are plausible, um, gets us down into this range. Very consistent range that we've been using for weeks and weeks and weeks. On the expenditure side, uh, baseline is important here. You can, that's why an update to this year is important. You'll carry that forward and start to make adjustments. There's no question, uh, irrespective of what the school year looks like, there's no question you'll continue likely to invest in, in distance learning. You'll need to be prepared should the virus surge again, or even if we open schools right on time that is probably a question out there. Um, many of the devices you've distributed to kids will not come back. Many of those one piece devices you distributed will come back in multiple pieces. So you're going to have some technology expenditures and yes, normally those would be discretionary expenditures that you would be the first. They would be the first thing to cut. You likely won't be cutting those as you go into this fall. You'll be making additional investments. We have potentially significant physical distancing costs. Every proposal that's out there or every um, potential option on reopening school, whether that's an A and B schedule, seeing kids 20% on Monday, 20% of your kids on Tuesday and so on, each of those don't come free. They come actually with extraordinary costs associated to them. Um, a and B schedule, while we have experience, LA Unified has great experience at doing an A and B schedule. Um, they didn't sanitize classrooms in between that morning and afternoon session, right? And if you just think of the minimum school day of 240 minute, 240 minutes and 240 minutes, that right there is eight hours. So our teachers, that will be over their work day, if you're expecting that teachers would teach both the A and the B schedules. So they'll at least be at a minimum some type of hourly adjustment uh, for that if if uh, that would have to be bargained, I suspect, along with any number of options here. All of these options, the bottom line, have some cost to them. There will also, though, be some flexibility in our regulations that may save you some dollars. And I believe that when we see the May revision, we will see a list of proposed flexibility um, items. We may see some additional flexibility items come from the legislature as they hold hearings and begin their debate and conversation. Um, there may be some additional flexibility items introduced by the administration over the next couple of weeks as they continue to vet ideas. But I suspect um, that you'll see things that are very similar to what you saw in the Great Recession. I want to remind you, though, that in the Great Recession in February of 2009, we got our greatest flexibility and that was with um, the creation of tier one, tier two, and tier three categorical programs. Tier three programs took a cut, but they were then fully flexed. It added tens of millions of dollars of flexible restricted dollars, I'm sorry, of restricted dollars, made them flexible uh, to use for general purposes. We don't have those programs anymore. They were also assumed and included in the LCFF. And so while we may see some relief on some regulatory types of activities, school year, um, adoption of new textbook materials, uh, the ability potentially to sell some land um, and use it for general fund purposes, those kinds of things, all of which we saw in the past, um, the dollar impact from each of those will vary widely from district to district. Some districts will be helped a great deal by this flexibility provision. Some districts won't be helped a whole lot. And so we certainly understand that. Reserves will continue to be relied upon and they'll continue to trend down. Uh, again, as the person that normally says, build your reserves up, um, I recognize that this late in the planning cycle, you are gonna have to turn to reserves. You can't cut everything. Um, I'm going to be honest with you at the level of cuts we're probably going to be faced with later this week. Um, you probably can't cut all those no matter what your 
um, timeline was in planning. They're just simply going to be um, difficult uh, to accomplish. And so you're going to rely in part on reserves. I remind you, though, that they are one piece of the puzzle. They are not the whole puzzle. And I'll also remind you, as I will in the next slide when I get there, that this is not a one-year issue. This is a multi-year issue, and you need to keep that in mind as you spend down reserves. You're going to need them a year from now. You're going to need them two years from now as well. So some key takeaways with regard to next year, possibility of budget revisions in the fall once we see our updated tax receipt data. You're all familiar with the delays to the, um, L to the LCAP process uh, that were covered by the executive order. There's a lot more details to be uh, flushed out of the LCAP process for the fall that will require legislation. So we'll see that in trailer bill language introduced in the next couple of weeks. The big unknown for all of us right now is what does the school year look like? How is it configured? Um, and so on. I heard a rumor yesterday from my neighbors, um, all of who are teachers, I don't know how we managed to buy. Um, we have teachers on both sides and across the street. My wife's a teacher, so we have this little cluster of houses that everybody's in education, but one of their districts is now talking about not opening until spring. And everybody freaks at that. And actually, I would say, you know what? There's probably a lot of wisdom in that. It creates immediate stability for everybody. We know what the plan is, no matter what the virus does, no matter what options the state may give us. But each of you will have to have that conversation, and the state will have to have the conversation about what options look like. There's a lot of conversation about what does ADA look like for next year. I think the commitment that we can expect from the state around ADA or enrollment-based funding or any of those topics that are going on in Sacramento, I think the commitment that we can expect from the state is just the same one we had this year. We will be held harmless from impacts of COVID-19 on our attendance. What that model looks like this year was very simple, right? Because this hit us late in the year three quarters of the way into the school year. What if we have a surge in October, right? Simply cutting our ADA off in October doesn't work as well as cutting it off in February, right? But the bottom line expectation I certainly would have of the state is that we will be held harmless from those impacts. Um, on cash, um, I, I skipped cash and I didn't mean to, so I'm gonna back up to cash um, on the, before the, the key takeaway. Um, you see the plus sign after June. If we approach cash deferral levels like we did in the Great Recession around 10 billion, that is more than June. June runs around two and a half to $3 billion. So just do that math on the back of an envelope. You know that you have to have more than one month of cash inter-year cash deferrals to get towards the 10 billion. And don't take it from me that we're gonna have 10 billion. Please relax, um, at least for another 24 hours or so. So you see the May revision, um, but that was the level that we had in the great recessions. And I expect that would be a standard that we may move towards. Um, my only point here is it's more than one month uh, to get to that high of a level. All righty, quick look at next year. You can all read this slide on your own. You're familiar with our advice around uh, multi-year financial planning. There is never ever an excuse not to have an updated accurate MYP. Uh, in times of uncertainty, um, you need one of these uh, updated, um, laminated, setting at the cabinet table, setting at each seat at the board dais, and decisions need to be made through uh, the lens of the MYP um, starting weeks ago and going forward for the next several years. Critical to what factors are in your MYP will be what the LAO calls the recessionary recovery. Is it a U-shaped or an L-shaped? How long does this go? Those are just great mental images. A U, we know we're at the bottom for a shorter period of time. An L, we're at the bottom for a longer period of time. Um, just uh, great mental images to help us explain the, the variance here that we may experience and how long this may go. In a U, we're expecting to see recovery in the next several months, or start recovery in the next several months, and then get back in a recovered period in a, in a year or so. In an L shape, um, that recovery would be delayed um, for um, over a year and not really begin until about mid-21 and then um, extend out from there. Next year, I don't believe will be the worst of the impacts on tax receipts. And so you see a number there of 10 to 
you need to do some scenarios that look in those ranges for that second year out. I don't have any advice on third year out right now. There just simply isn't sufficient data to forecast that. BASC and your county office partners uh, will certainly be in conjunction with the Department of Finance when they issue their common message we'll, in the next uh, couple of weeks. We'll certainly provide some guidance around those multi-year um, to cover your three-year period. So real quick, before we get to Q&A, just remind you of some resources on our webpage. CASBO has resources, School Services has resources, LAO, Department of Finance, lots of resources out there. But um, Sarah, if you can back up one or whoever's pressing that button, Christina, thank you. Um, on our webpage alone, we have three fiscal alerts out there. The middle one there on effective cash management um, is, is one I would encourage you to focus on. The one on the left on preparing budget scenarios will become um, old tonight at the strike of midnight, at the stroke of midnight, right? Um, and the one on the right is for those of you dealing with ASB issues around COVID-19 and having unspent funds and thinking you're gonna spend it on on students that are actually not students in the fall because they've all graduated. We've given you some guidance there um, on the professional standards uh, that you should consider and maybe some ways to work around those. So with that, uh, Sarah, I think I turn it over to you. All yours. Thank you so much, Mike. So the way we will handle uh, the flow of questions, we have a few already entered in the Q&A box and Christina will read them one at a time until we see um, people raise their hands. Uh, she'll read the first two questions that have been written out and we'll give Mike an opportunity to respond. Uh, and then we'll line up folks who have an icon of raise your hand uh, and that way we will put you on the queue to speak or comment and your question can be directed at any of us. Um, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mike. I have several questions on the docket. Uh, any ideas on how much lottery is down in the current year? Um, and in your opinion, is it too early to halt discretionary spending? Mike, you're on mute. Thank you. Not too early to um, halt discretionary spending. Uh, most districts uh, I would have expected would have done that, started that weeks ago. Um, you say, you know, why do I need to do that? Um, being held harmless this year, you need to do that because you need to beef up your reserves and hold those over for next year. Uh, with regard to lottery, um, so, we can again turn to the Great Recession for some experience. In the first two years of the Great Recession, lottery dropped by about 15%. Uh, we are obviously in a little different environment right now um, because people have been sheltering at home and some points of sale locations for lottery have been closed. And so I would expect on the near term, it would drop even more just because of those variables. But the Lottery Commission already has third quarter out um, Fourth quarter will be uh, what we would be estimating. And I certainly expect fourth quarter to be fairly reflective of the drop in third quarter. Um, so uh, over the course of a cup of this year and next year, you know, using the Great Recession, 15% is probably a reasonable number to take a look at. Thank you, Mike. Uh, next question. California needs the federal government to help with this national pandemic. To what extent have they helped now? So we have the CARES Act uh, from the feds and it has two significant pieces for um, our purposes. One is a governor's uh, grant, uh, about 350 million roughly. Um, and then what we often are referring to, actually as three pieces, a, a Title I, for lack of a better term, grant that's worth a about 1.6 billion, then uh, there's about, I can't remember our share, about 800 million, I think, Sarah, you have to check me in nutrition, um, I believe. Um, so all total, a little over 2 billion in the CARES Act, that's what we know about. The state has applied for that money. Uh, last time I checked, the feds had not approved that application, but I expect that's, if it's not already happened, will happen shortly. 
the, the interest of the feds is not only to be helpful, but is to stimulate the economy. So they want that money out circulating, right? There's currently a debate in Washington over a additional aid bill for state and local governments. Um, the House um, introduced um, a bill, I've lost track of time, I think it was yesterday, maybe it was the day before. Um, Three trillion, I think, was what it added to. Um, Governor Newsom had uh, proposed, I think, a trillion um, to assist state and local governments. There are different versions, as you appreciate the chaos in Washington um, of everybody, how they come together nowadays and work through this. There are different versions. Some of the versions include assistance for school districts and charters, and some do not. And so, uh, again, I will say this, I think one of the reasons the governor released the data on revenues and impacts last Thursday uh, was in part to help influence that. So there's actually some factual numbers that people could turn to, not only folks in Washington, but each of you can turn to and talk intelligently about the impacts in your community uh, with your federal representatives. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, the federal government played a significant role in assistance in the Great Recession. Uh, they will play a significant role here. They can run a deficit as we're all too familiar with, and they do have the government printing office where they can print um, on that special green paper that the state can't. Thank you, Mike. I have several questions in the queue uh, regarding the LCFF calculator and negative COLA. I'll read a couple of them uh, to kind of uh, bring that all forward. I heard the FICMAT LCFF calculator does not accept negative COLA, when will it be updated with a deficit factor as in the revenue limit days? Uh, is the LCFF calculator able to calculate negative COLA? Uh, I got it. Uh, yep. So um, we were in, a, in, a, in the midst of a massive overhaul of the LCFF calculator when all of this hit. Um, because we're fully funded, we don't need a lot of the functionality that was in the calculator. And we just didn't get to starting to clean all that up till this year. And I think the people working on that are probably took a break to listen in on this session. So they need to get back to work now. Um, they are uh, working on it. The you it does. Uh, so our official advice would be it does not accept a negative cola. Um, when we release the May revision version of it, it will accept a cola, and then we'll have a new. Um, added data point, for lack of a better term, just because it's our old term, right, from revenue limit days, a deficit factor that you can put in that will, in essence, uh, create that negative, that net negative COLA that you're looking for. Um, so the LCFF calculator is driven by facts. We're not going to put something out that we think is what the state's going to do. We will wait for them to make that decision. And so, while the Department of Finance may release a May revise a May revision this week, it will ultimately take um, CDE to work through uh, the intent of that May revision as it expresses it in language um, and apply that intent to the various formulas. And uh, as soon as they do that and model that, then uh, we will replicate that in the LCFF calculator. And I expect that to be just days. Um, we are uh, have got a good head start on what we think the state's going to do. Um, and we just need fine detail, you know, some of the detail to be fine tuned um, around that. And we're in regular contact with CDE about this. Uh, they know that there's a lot of reliance on that calculator. And the minute they have finished their modeling of the May revision, then we will like I said, we'll replicate that for you. And Mike, many of the questions that have come in are regarding LCFF, knowing that we'll see high migration of families moving, yes. more student qualifying for, for low income, free and reduced meals. And so how do they begin making those connections um, in an era of declining enrollment? A great question and observation. Those enrollment projections that you prepared uh, late last fall or in January as part of your planning cycle need to be revisited. Um, think back to what happened in the Great Recession. We did remember, though, that the reason 
the, the initial ca cause isn't the right word, the, the initial facts around the Great Recession in those early years um, more, more involved a little bit more of the real estate market uh, than what this has, right? We've seen sales volume go way down in this first month, but we've not seen prices drop quite yet, at least not reported as such. Um, and the folks that are generally unemployed at this point, there's a high concentration on low um, wage earners, service workers, and they typically are a lower percentage of homeowners. So all that to say is we still have to see uh, what happens with regard to the real estate market and assess valuations and so on um, that will influence some of that movement. But you're 100% correct, um, Sarah, there will be impacts because unemployment means I can't afford rent. I move back with mom and dad or grandparents, therefore my kids move. And each of you know your community and your district better. You know whether those kids will stay in your community or, and they just leave school A and go to school B or under federal statute can stay in school A actually, um, because at that point they become technically homeless, right? Moving in with grandparents um, or whether they're moving uh, from the coast inland or inland back to the, the grandparents in the coast, whatever the case may be. And so your principals and your school site staff obviously are key to that information. I realize that they're at a disadvantage because schools close, they're not interacting with parents and so on, but your teachers are interacting with kids. They need to listen carefully to their kids' comments on those distance learning and that the interaction with kids, what's going on. My wife's a school teacher. She has 19 of her 20 kids uh, regularly every day that she interacts with. She knows though where the 20th one is and they're not here local any longer, right? Feeding that information back to her principal and then back through the channels um, obviously is important information. Most of your school districts have already done that. They've, they've tried to ensure that they've accounted for all kids and figured out what their story is, right? Um, uh, and for our instructional colleagues that are on the call, Understanding a child's story, you, you know very well uh, the importance of that. Um, so you'll have to update those. And yes, you're gonna have to look at your uh, unduplicated count. There's no question that we'll have more families qualify for free and reduced price meals. We'll have, um, well, that's really the variable that we're gonna have, right? We're not gonna see a dramatic increase in EL or foster as a result of this, but certainly um, the, the economic impacts. Um, make intelligent decisions here. Don't get carried away. Don't build your budget on assumption that your unduplicated count goes up by 5%. Um, that, that won't make a whole lot of sense, right? Um, wait till the facts are in and you see that. Um, but updating enrollment, if you're in a high priced area, all the apartments in your school district are at the upper end of rents, uh, those will impact you. Um, and you know what those clusters are. You know where your kids are coming from by looking at your data. Um, so you just have to take a close look at it. And I know we finally have a few hands, but something that's come up in, we've seen in the past during the Great Recession was reductions in instructional minutes in the year. Is that a strategy that you believe that should be pursued given the magnitude of these reductions? Great, great question. I think on the natural, um, the state uh, lowering the minimum days from 180 to 175. Uh, we did that in the Great Recession for a couple of years. Um, and it was used, you know, sporadically across the state. So on the natural, I think that can happen. What will weigh against that is that we reduced this school year <laughs> pretty significantly. Um, and there's concern about learning loss and there's concern about that instructional time. Uh, we've got a lot of school districts talking about summer school programs to help make that up. Um, I don't think they fully have comprehended the budgetary impacts of all of that yet, right? So there'll be some balance. I, I don't know that it's a given, Sarah. Um, I, I would absolutely say it's on a list somewhere, but I don't know that it's a given because of this balance about concern about kids' instructional time. Um, and because, and we also have to remember the state simply provides that flexibility. At the local level, you'll have to negotiate that. And so we won't, even if the state provides the flexibility to do that, 
we will see sporadic implementation simply because of local uh, negotiations with our, our labor partners. And Christina, I'll turn it to you for the people, the two or three people that have raised their hands. Only two or three. Thank you, Sarah. Well, two or three and we're 60 questions in the Q&A. A question from him. Uh, Rick no, Brown. One of them, don't do it. <laughs> Rick Brown, I see your hand raised. The floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Um, so there is some concern that this next fall there will be a significantly greater wildfire and power safety shutoff scenario. And in an environment where there's a lot of online and distance learning, that could mean that teachers, much less students, much less districts, won't be able to do their jobs. Uh, they'll be, you know, their power will be out. If they can't do the distance learning. Is there, do you assume that they'll, you know, there'll be a hold harmless on that or should districts in those high risk areas be planning uh, for how to deal with that, that possibility? Yeah, great question. There's already a hold harmless for that. Uh, the J13A uh, process, um, what may be different uh, and CDE will have to speak to this at some point as we approach that uh, is the documentation that they may require. Will they be a little bit more relaxed about the documentation given the just the general nature of uncertainty and impacts across districts right now? But we already have a hold harmless process for that. Um, what is key, and I suspect CDE will um, consider this, uh, what is key in the power safety shutoff world is that if you are in an area subject to that, they ultimately over time are gonna expect you to build in some provision for that in your calendar so that you don't each year have to file for, um, for that waiver, just like we do for community, for districts that are um, have snow days. Um, districts that have snow days don't apply for waivers each year. Over time, they have built those snow days into their calendar and they anticipate them. And that will be the new norm once we get there. I think the difference will be when will that be the new norm? I don't think that's next year, right? I don't think that burden will be next year. I think it'll be um, out uh, a couple years, but CDE will address that. They're certainly very sensitive to that. Let me say this, there is nobody in Sacramento of, of the variety of, of officials and groups that I certainly deal with every day and talk to every day. There's not a single one of them that intends, that, that is going to do anything that's harmful um, if they can prevent it. They are going to be fully cooperative. They are sensitive to what you're going through um, and so on. The budget implications are simply out of their control. What's not out of their control is some of those regulatory items and considerations around some flexibility around that. And they will do everything they can to make your life um, a little easier as you serve kids. That's the ultimate goal. They completely understand that there's significant impacts here. And so I think that's the attitude they've shown through all this. It's frankly their historical attitude. It's the attitude they've shown the last six weeks. I, they'll continue that without question in my mind. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I have Rabinder, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So we, we had a, a charter school that recently converted to a district school. And so their, their ADA is about 650 students. Um, I'm wondering how the home, uh, hold harmless will work in this situation where our ADA uh, will, will be uh, increased next year if we were to just add it together. So we're wondering how that would work. Well, so the current hold harmless that the governor uh, had in his executive order back in March expires basically on June 30th. It was for this school year. Uh, when I use the term hold harmless for next year, we don't know yet what um, we have to make an assumption that we're going to have ADA at P2 like normal for next year, right? That's our assumption. Uh, but there are a lot of conversations around, do we use prior year um, across the board because it's more stable? Do we shift on a short-term basis to an enrollment base and not ADA? Because we don't quite know what the school year is going to look like. Uh, who opens when, who closes because of a surge in the virus, who then reopens, all those variables. My, so my term hold harmless relative to ADA next year is no matter what happens, the state's intent, I think, would be to hold districts harmless 
from COVID-19 impacts on ADA. Okay. Whatever that looks like, those details are yet to be figured out. Um, but I think that would be their intent. It would be to replicate what they did this year um, as appropriate for next year uh, mechanically. So um, I understand what you're asking. When that charter converts, um, we move from uh, current year to uh, potential prior year, um, higher a prior year or current year. Um, I need to think through that and probably have somebody smarter than I am, my staff, um, think through that with me. Um, let me offer this. If you just email me, mfine at ficmat.org, um, just with your contact, I will have somebody follow up. It's, it may not be a question we can answer today, but we can certainly answer it as current law exists and current practice exists, and then know where the variables are for you to follow up on uh, once that's nailed down with CDE. Given the time, we want to respect how busy you are, Mike. We are taking down all of the questions that have been lined up in the queue and names of folks that um, have requested information, uh, and we will expedite that uh, as soon as possible in getting out answers and, and trying to get all that information out. Our presentation will be made available as soon as possible, as well as the recording. We have information lined up in our resources as part of our presentation. Any further questions that our members might have, you're always welcome to direct them at sbaches at casbo.org and we will line them up with Mike and we will coordinate. We do want to let you know that as your advocate in Sacramento and DC, we're working diligently with both administration, the State Department of Education, and the legislature to let them know of all of these questions and concerns as, they be, as they've returned last week to deliberate on the budget process. Next week, starting on Monday, they will begin um, reviewing the governor's May revision that is expected to come out tomorrow. Tomorrow, you'll see Elizabeth and I release our news break breaking down all the details of the governor's May revision. As part of your advocacy team, we're chairing the superintendent's budget task force committee, where we're really working through with our union partners, management groups, and various organizations on all of the implications before our school districts in the considerations of reopening and sustaining what is a painful experience. We want you to know that we're always here to represent you questions, always feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much for your time, Mike Fine. We truly appreciate you. We appreciate your support and recognition. Um, and with that, please feel free to reach us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.